Well, good afternoon, everybody. We want to welcome you to our Christmas Eve, Christmas afternoon, Christmas Eve afternoon candlelight service. This is a rather different experience than where I'm from back in Wisconsin. I don't think they're having an outdoor Christmas Eve service today. I checked the weather back there. It was 15 degrees this afternoon, so they're not doing this. This is one of the delights of living where we live. So welcome to those of you who are here present in the courtyard. And as you probably know, we're also streaming this online. And so welcome to those of you who are online and at home. We are glad that you are tuning in and joining us to our candlelight Christmas Eve service. One of our favorite traditions at Oak Hills is to gather together on this most holy uh, night to relive the story of Jesus' birth, to slow ourselves down in the midst of what has probably been a chaotic and busy Advent season, to take the time to pause and enter into the story so that we experience it all over again, or maybe in some of our cases, we experience it for one of the first times. This service is an important one in the annual rhythm of who we are as a congregation. It's become important to us in terms of how it shapes us, how it forms the way we think about Christmas, how it forms the way we think about the entire Advent season. And this particular service is especially important in this most bizarre year of 2020. So I want to invite you young, and old and every age in between, whether you are here in person or tuning in online, I want to invite you to do your best to enter into this experience. And in order to enter into it, it will be most helpful if you have the Oak Hills app on your phone or whatever device. And the reason for that is, is because we have a lot of uh, opportunities throughout the course of this service for you to respond for you to read your part, for you to sing, and the lyrics and those responses are all in the Oak Hills app. And so I would encourage you um, to download that Oak Hills Folsom. You can get that and everything that you'll need to respond and participate tonight will be uh, in the app. In addition, later on, we'll be celebrating communion. So hopefully you have either brought something here or you received it when you walked in. If you were at home, would encourage you to get whatever elements you're going to use for the bread and for the cup ready. And later on, we will prepare ourselves to come to the table and we will eat together and we will drink together as part of our Christmas Eve celebration. The Christmas story speaks deep mysteries of God and about God, about the world, and about being human and what it means to be human. The Christmas story points to foundational truths about this universe. If you will, it kind of peels back the curtain on this world and shows us what is sometimes called ultimate reality or the reality of God's kingdom. And we hope tonight in this setting, in this environment, as we take time to be together, we hope to get swept up into that ultimate reality story this afternoon and spend some time pondering the mystery and experiencing the wonder together. Join me up here in leading tonight's service is B.B. Glynn. B.B. is, yes, give her a round of applause. B.B. is part of our church family, as is her family, and so we are very glad to have her here. Throughout the time that we read from the various scriptures, we'll be using Eugene Peterson's version of the scripture. It's in uh, called The Message, and so just to give you some sort of context with that. But I really want to emphasize that each of us has a role to play tonight in telling this Christmas story. A long time ago, we decided at Oak Hills that we weren't going to make the Christmas Eve service flashy or splashy or big or bombastic because it seems rather incompatible with the way Jesus entered into this world. We also decided that we weren't going to just present it from up front and ask you to consume it, but rather we want to invite you to recognize you're here tonight and you have a role to play in the telling and in the retelling of the story. I think it adds something that we're outside. I think it adds something that it's a little bit cold and that it will undoubtedly be colder as we go through the service. And in this imperfect setting at the end of what has been a rather imperfect year, 
we've gathered here to tell this most, most beautiful story of God's endless love for human beings. So again, it matters that you're here. It matters that you're tuned in online, and we are glad you are. Tonight, we will read the miraculous story of Jesus' birth. We'll sing some Christmas hymns. We will pray together. As I mentioned, we will come and feast at the Lord's table, and we will simply ponder this good news that brings great joy to all the world. The long wait is finally over. The King has finally come. Thanks be to God. Would you please uh, turn to your app, our call to worship this evening is in the app, and you can see the parts that I'll be reading, you can see the parts that Bibi will be reading, and the all represents the part that we encourage you to read. So let us begin our time together. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who lived in a land of deep shadows. Light, sunburst of light. For a child has been born for us. The gift of a son for us. He will, he will take, take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God. Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. His ruling authority will grow. And there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Would you bow and pray with me? Our gracious and good and loving Heavenly Father, we have gathered together here this afternoon on this holy day, this day where we reflect upon sacred things, this day where we recognize how awesome, how inspiring, how very much beyond us and bigger than us your incarnation is, the celebration of your coming into the world, the recognition that it contains a mystery we can only partially comprehend, but it never grows old and it never grows tired. So we thank you for this occasion to gather together in the name of Jesus, to lift his name up, to reflect upon these important things, to open ourselves to your Holy Spirit and what he might want to say to us as we read your scripture and as we reflect upon your truth. We are grateful for each one who is here for the opportunity we have to join our voices together and celebrate the coming of our King. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. First this, God created the heavens and the earth, all we see and all we don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke. Light, sky, earth, and ocean. Sun, moon, stars, fish, birds, cattle, reptiles, wild animals, plants, trees. Men, women, he created them reflecting God's nature and bless them, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. But when the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized what she would get out of it, that she'd know everything, she took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband and he ate. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called to the man, where are you? Adam said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid and I hid. And darkness once again fell over the earth and over the human heart and both now needed a savior. All of history converges in Christ, and everything changes in the light of his coming. We invite you to sing. Touch them. 
God told Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their people, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. Jeremiah announced, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. His days, Judea, will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. But it had been nearly 400 years since Nehemiah, the last prophet of the Jewish nation, had spoken. 400 years of political and social upheaval in which the Jewish people had endured oppression. And throughout these four centuries, the prophets were silent and God was silent. All of history converges in Christ and everything changes in the light of his coming. Mother only 
hands made more Earth stood hard as iron Water like a stone Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean, Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judea. He went with Mary, his fiance, who was pregnant. While they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for Mary to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to God the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. All of history converges in Christ, and everything changes in the light of his coming. Yeah. 
Suddenly God's angels stood among the shepherds and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I am here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody, worldwide. A Savior has just been born in Bethlehem. A Savior who is both Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. For the shepherds, seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the shepherds were impressed and filled with wonder. The shepherds arrived back at their fields and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. All of history converges in Christ, and everything changes in the light of His coming. reading from Luke chapter 2 verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. 
The great writer and thinker C.S. Lewis often spoke of what he called the inconsolable longing in the heart for we know not what. Now that may seem elusive, maybe a bit confusing, but I suspect most of us know what Lewis was talking about because we've experienced this inconsolable, unnamed longing. Lewis used the German word Sehnsucht to try and capture the essence of this, long, this longing. German words are kind of fun to say. They've got a certain punch to them. They can be hard to say. But German words, it seems to me, often sound weightier, more substantial than many of our English words. The sound of a good German word has a way of conveying the meaning of the word just in the sound. Sehnsucht. We translate it longing or yearning. But our language actually lacks a single word to capture the full meaning of Sehnsucht. Here's the meaning. It's a sickness caused by a yearning desire. Just a beautiful idea. One we have likely experienced in our lives, even if we can't spit out a definition. A sickness caused by a yearning desire. It's the pain of an unfulfilled longing. It is the ache of an unmet desire. Our daughter Izzy has been in Spain since the early part of October. And last Monday, Julie and Abby and I went to the San Francisco airport to pick her up with hearts that were pulsating with Zainzucht. We've longed for Izzy to return. And at times, that longing has hurt and has been painful. When we got to the airport, we waited with others who were waiting for their family or friends. And the way it was set up, because it's an international flight, you're kind of situated in this long hallway, and these doors open where the passengers who were coming from Spain would exit. And we were standing there waiting with lots of other family and friends who were waiting for their family and friends. And all around us, standing there, you could see and you could feel Sehnsucht. A young girl came through the international door and ran to her mom, and they held this long embrace. Sehnsucht fulfilled. When Izzy walked through the door, we all experienced the healing of the ache of missing someone we love. Well, the Advent season is a season of Sehnsucht, waiting for God to arrive and bring healing and goodness and deliverance. The Israelite people waited with longing for centuries and even more for God to send his Messiah. Throughout history, in a variety of ways, people with faith and people without faith have waited for God to come and waited for God to bring his deliverance. And today is the day Christians celebrate the fulfillment of this painful longing in the arrival of Jesus Christ. Hope arrives. Hope has come. God's answer to life's agonies is born this day in the city of David, and he is Christ the Lord. And perhaps more than any other year since you and I have been alive, people all over the world, religious and irreligious, feel an inconsolable longing this Christmas season. The pandemic has swept away normal life as we know it and left fear, death, separation, distance, and loneliness in its place. I would be willing to bet a few shiny nickels. Every now and then, the shepherds we read about in the Christmas story sat around a campfire under a majestic night sky, maybe sipped something, and talked about their desires talked about their inconsolable longings. Even if they didn't have those kinds of words, they talked about what they longed for, what they hoped for, what they wanted. Is taking care of these goofy sheep, is that it for us? Is that all we've got? Is that why we're here to chase these 
kind of not so smart animals around this mountainside? Is this all there is to our existence? Luke chapter 2, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. See what's happening there. The angels' announcement about the birth of Jesus awakened the shepherds. They snapped out of it, if you will. The angel's announcement about the birth of Jesus gave language to the shepherds' longings. It spoke to something deep within them, and it stoked their hope. And for any Jewish person living in the first century, the angel's words were familiar. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The town of David, a savior, the Messiah, the Lord. All these words and phrases were lifted straight from the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote about the coming Messiah 700 years earlier. And these shepherds would have grown up hearing about the day when the Messiah would finally come. And now, maybe, possibly, tonight was the night. So they abandoned their sheep and they hustled to Bethlehem, were told to see this thing that has happened. And when they saw the baby lying in a manger, somehow they finally found what they had been looking for, hoping for, waiting for. Their painful longing had finally found its healer. And then the shepherds went back to work. They went back to being shepherds. But work was never the same again. Life was never the same again. They were never the same again. How can a baby born into obscurity 2,020 years ago be the one who satisfies this inconsolable human longing? How is that even possible? Is it even possible? Or is this story simply an elixir we humans have concocted to numb the pain of this rather unsatisfying life. The inconsolable longing in the heart for we know not what. We've all experienced this longing. We've all experienced what C.S. Lewis is trying to capture in this phrase. This inconsolable longing sometimes sneaks up and taps us on our shoulder. But the time, by the time we make the time to turn and have a look, it's gone. This inconsolable longing rises in us at unexpected times, but politely fades away as the busyness of life consumes us. We know this inconsolable longing. I imagine some of you are thinking of a time right now when you have felt this inconsolable longing, this Zainzucht. We're both drawn to it and a little bit afraid of it. It soothes and it stings. It comforts us and in a way that's hard to put into words, it grieves us. The inconsolable longing awakens sometimes when we stand in front of nature's indescribable beauty. You've probably been there. This inconsolable longing awakens when we watch a daughter fall into the arms of her mother at the International Depot at the San Francisco airport. This inconsolable longing awakens when we gaze into the eyes of a baby and she smiles back at us. This inconsolable longing awakens when we read a sentence or a paragraph from a writer who knows Zainzucht in their own soul, and they know how to string words together to articulate it. The advent of Jesus Christ in the, into this world 2,020 years ago is good news that causes great joy for all who inconsolably long and hope, and wait. Jesus is the satisfier of our longing. He is 
the fulfiller of our hope. He is what we spend lifetimes and fortunes looking for and waiting for. One last thing about this. When the shepherds first heard this good news, just try to get into that for a second. All these centuries have gone by. However much they had hoped for a Messiah, centuries and more had passed without a Messiah. So when the shepherds first heard this good news, it's really hard for me to imagine that they instantaneously understood it all or that at the snap of a finger, it all suddenly made perfect sense to them or that every ounce of their doubt suddenly vanished. I just have a hard time believing that. Since the shepherds were perfectly human, and they were real, they were authentic. I can't imagine everything suddenly, instantaneously made sense and fit neatly in their minds and in their hearts. I doubt they suddenly and instantly believed without ever doubting or wondering again. But what they did do is they hustled to Bethlehem to check it out. The angel awakened their imagination the angel awakened their longing. And this compelled the shepherds to head to Bethlehem to see for themselves, as the Bible says. And hustling to Bethlehem to see for ourselves remains a wonderful response to the coming of Jesus Christ. The rigid categories of believe over here or don't believe over here hardly describe the way faith works for most of us. Those who profess to believe sometimes live as though they don't believe. And those who profess to not believe sometimes live as though they do believe. So the whole thing is more encompassing than the rigid categories of believe or don't believe. Faith is certainly not a fixed position only involving our thoughts about God or our thoughts about Jesus. Faith is certainly not a mental exercise of merely acknowledging, yes, Jesus came, or not acknowledging, no, Jesus didn't come. Faith is far more encompassing than these categories. When the shepherds hustled to Bethlehem and saw this sight for themselves, it started changing them. It changed how they lived tomorrow. It changed how they shepherded the rest of their lives, something in them that was as real as the bleeding sheep they corralled every night was different because they laid their eyes on God in the flesh. I like how the poet and novelist Mary Carr puts it. She writes and says it this way, faith is a choice like any other. If you're picking a career or a husband or deciding whether to have a baby, there are feelings and reasons pro and con out the wazoo. But thinking it through is, at the final hour, horse dookie. You can only try it out. Well, Jesus came to reveal God to us and show us the way to real life and actually satisfy our inconsolable longing. And if something in us awakens at the possibility of this, or even wonders, however slightly, could this be true? Is it even possible that this baby we tip a hat to once a year could possibly be the one who satisfies our inconsolable longings? If there's even anything in us, however slight it might be that wonders, could this be true? In the wonderful language of James Smith, if something in us is, and here I quote, spooked by the longings this articulates, naming something that wells up in us from some subterranean cavern in our consciousness, and we feel stupid that we're crying, but we can't stop. And we wanna just blame it on the bourbon and the loneliness. And yet there is the oddest taste of some distant joy calling to us in those tears. And we're not sure what to do with any of this, end quote. I would suggest that maybe it's time to check out this thing that happened 
2,020 years ago. Jesus is who we are looking for. He satisfies the inconsolable longing. He heals the zainzoot in our soul. And he is what Christmas is all about. He is good news that causes great joy. His name is Jesus, God with us. And we can know him. Everything changes in the light of his coming. I mentioned earlier a few things that awaken the inconsolable longing in us. Nature awakens it. A baby looking back at us and smiling awakens it. Music is one of the things that awakens it. The word hallelujah is a Hebrew word that means praise the Lord. Long time ago, back in the 80s, eons ago for some of you, ancient history for some of you, a song was written simply called Hallelujah. You've probably heard it. It beautifully captures Zainzut, human longing. It is not a distinctly religious song. It's far more messier than that. It's much more nuanced than a religious song, which is what I love about it. It both praises the Lord, like the word says, and through the lyrics and haunting melody and haunting harmony, it expresses the inconsolable longing within us, the zainzut, the longing for peace, the longing for healing, the longing for redemption, the longing for God in the midst of a broken world, a broken world. Hallelujah, as the song says. And at the end of this bizarre year of 2020, and on this holy night where we celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus, I cannot think of a better way to express the beauty and the pain and the inconsolable longing within us than by saying and singing that beautiful word, hallelujah. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we offer up glory and honor and praise to you in this moment. We may not even comprehend what any of that means. None of us comprehends what all that means. But we thank you for this timeless story that reverberates throughout history and has captivated billions because it speaks to something deep within that is restless. Until it finds rest in you. We thank you and we pray in your name. Amen.
baby, I've been here before. I've seen this room and I've walked this floor. You know I used to live alone before I knew you. I've seen your flag on the marble. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. To better comprehend the scope and the magnitude of the Advent story, it must be seen in light of the Easter story. And so this holy night, we remember Christ of the manger, who shows us who God is, shows us who we can become, shows us what life can be like. We remember Christ of the cross, who offers himself as a sacrifice for our sins so that we might be forgiven and reconciled to God. And we remember Christ of the empty grave, who demonstrates his power over all things, including sin and evil and death. And so we invite all of you who are here tonight, who are followers of Jesus Christ, to celebrate his table with us if you are watching at home, I encourage you to gather up your elements if you haven't done that yet. I believe most of you either brought something or you have um, this little package here that is both the juice and the wafer all rolled up in one. And I'd like to invite us to begin with a moment of quiet prayer. And I simply would encourage you to use this to talk with God about whatever is on your heart to thank him, spend a moment in quiet prayer and we'll begin it. Can encourage you to follow along in your app as we begin our communion liturgy. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is our joy and our salvation at all times and in all places to give thanks to you, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus our Lord, because the light of your glory has shone with splendor in our world. 
For he gave Jesus to be born for us that we might have power to become your tr children through him. He became poor that by his poverty we might become rich. He was humbled that we might be exalted. He gave us peace and joy when we were without hope and without God. Therefore, with the whole company of saints in heaven and earth, we proclaim and celebrate the birth of our Savior, and we sing with joy. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Faithful, good, and worthy, full of grace and truth, blessed be your name. On the night Jesus was betrayed, arrested, and sentenced to death, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. So I encourage you to get whatever you have for bread ready. I think if you open these little packets... I don't know what happens if you open that little pack. It's like my contact lens case when I open it and there's not one in there. I don't see. There's supposed to be a wafer in there, isn't there? It's the top part. Oh, it's the top part, this yeah. plastic thing? Yeah, you flip it over. You know, BB's taken over here. We bring her up here one time and now she's in charge. It's the, what is it? This part, and then oh. it's right there. It's all crumpled. Well. Broken hallelujahs and now broken wafers. Perfect. We are very grateful for what Jesus has done for us, for the life that he has lived, his birth, his teaching, his life, his sacrifice. So with gratitude in our hearts for what he has done for us, let's take and eat together. When supper was over, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and drink it, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you would take the cup, and with gratitude in our hearts, let's drink together. And as often as we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. May our lives be resurrection lives, always proclaiming the mystery of Advent. Christ is born, Christ of the manger, Christ is God with us. Christ is born, Christ of the manger, Christ is God with us. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus Christ, this is your night, this is your time, this is your day, this is your season. And we again bow before you and we say hallelujah. Praise our Lord. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for being born in such obscurity and humility to teach us who you are, to teach us who God is. Thank you for this table where we remember your life, your teaching, your death, your resurrection, and the opportunity, the hope we have because you have come and dwelled among us. So we worship you, we thank you as our King, and we pray in your name, amen. This is the testimony. God gave us eternal life. The life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever rejects the Son rejects light. God is light, pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in Him. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone has come into the world. So now you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. For those who have been with us before, this is when we would all we would come and light all your candles. But we can't do that this year for obvious reasons. If you got uh, you received a matchbook, hopefully you've got a way to light your candle. We ask you to do this at this time. like to invite you to sing along with us. We are grateful that you were able to spend part of your Christmas with us. We are grateful to our Lord Jesus Christ for the chance to gather, to celebrate him, to exalt him as our king and as the light of the world. And we're thankful for the opportunity we have to do this on a regular basis and to be the church together. So I do want to mention regarding Sunday, 
Uh, we will have a service this Sunday, but because of the weather, the way things look, it's going to be, uh, it might rain, it probably will rain. If it doesn't rain, it'll be wet and cold. So we're going to just stream this Sunday's service. As you may know, throughout Advent, we've been talking about the fact that this is a season of hope. And Sunday, we're going to have an opportunity for you to share online some of the experiences of hope, the encounters with God, things that you have seen and witnessed uh, this year and in this Advent season. And you'll be able to write those in. And we have a couple people who will be sharing about their experiences. So we hope you'll join us at 1030 on Sunday. Again, thank you for being here uh, today, when you leave, there is a box over here somewhere that you can put your candle in. Put the candle out before you put before you put the candle in the box. Just, Greg, I wanted you to kind of know that. Just anyway. <laughs> we better wrap this up. So, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Merry Christmas.